the Rosello and Canal Podcast. Number three, Rosillo and Canal ESPN Radio presented by Progressive Insurance, comparing rates to help you save. Now that's Progressive. Call or click today. Find out how much Progressive could save you. Matt Berry, Danny Canal, and Wright Thompson in studio our ESPN Magazine brilliant writer who just penned a piece on Pat Riley that will be in ESPN the magazine. And, and often is the case when you read one of these long forms, you come out of it learning so much. And, right, you sat down in the studio with us a second ago, and I said, it, it appears to me Pat Riley has a conflict. For you, what was it like spending time with someone who's hard to get? Well, I mean, with him, the conflict is so was so apparent. Uh, and I think a lot of people in powerful positions or driven people, mm-hmm. you know, have, you know, the tell yourself that you're working to create a life that you want when really you're working because you love the way that that work makes you feel or you love the way that that work makes you not feel. Mm-hmm. I mean, those things are, I think, very related. And so the problem, you know, the issue for many people is like how to walk away. Nobody wants to be Willie Mays in the outfield. Right. You know, like what's the how do you know when it's time to stop your life's work. I mean, you know, I'm trying to think, uh, you know, if I had to stop this job, I mean, almost my entire adult life I've done, I've written these stories and I'm not like, it'd be interesting to talk about like when you walked away from football and did something else, uh, like your whole identity since you were tiny has been, I'm good at this thing. Mm -hmm. And now that thing doesn't exist, so you're not good at it, so you're not good at anything, and you don't have anything else, and now you're just a guy that used to do a thing. Mm-hmm. And I think that, like, people struggle with that. I mean, you talked about the conflict with LeBron. Yeah. I mean, I think that they're the exact same person. I don't know. I mean, like, it, no, I've, I've talked about it on this show. It's yeah. one of the toughest challenges I've ever been through is going from that transition. And I can only imagine it at 72 years old, like, having had that much more time invested into your craft or whatever it is. And, it, it, you know, when he was a young kid, he grew up in Schenectady, uh, you know, started living in like a Polish-Irish blue-collar housing project, sort of slowly moving up State Street. If anyone in, is from Schenectady, <laughs> they'll know, like, a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better. And, you know, like a real sort of, you know, n- not rich at all. I mean, tough, you know, and, and uh, neither of his parents ever went to a single college or NBA game. Mm-hmm. And, you know, his high school coach – I mean, uh, saved might be too dramatic, but his high school coach is the most important figure in his life, probably. Yeah. I mean, you talk about, like, uh, the night before the 1966 uh, NCAA championship game, Pat, when he would get really stressed out, would break out, like, almost like really bad case of athlete's foot. And, like, his feet would break out from stress. And his high school basketball coach is sitting in his hotel room in Maryland soaking his feet so Pat can sleep. I mean, like, you can't overstate how much... Pat Riley's high school basketball coach meant to him. But, you know, so he is straight up from Schenectady, uh, sort of getting in fights a lot of the time growing up, fifth, you know, out on the streets. His dad would send him to the park to fight. And the nuns were really rough on him at the Catholic, Catholic school where he went to, would, like, lock him in the basement down with the rats. And sometimes they'd forget about him. And his dad would come to school at, like, 830 and be like, where's Pat? He didn't come home. And the nuns were like, oh, my God, he's in the basement. And so when he was in sixth grade, they asked him to play in a JV basketball game. And he scored 19 points. And those same nuns that had locked him in uh, the basement Mm -hmm. gave him a standing ovation in, like, homeroom or whatever they had then. And, you know, like, his wife, who's a professional therapist, is basically like, he's still that kid. Do you know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. like, And you point that out in the piece. And you do a great job interviewing Chris because she she puts out there on numerous occasions that she doesn't believe – She's got him cold. Half of what he's saying. <laughs> She's got him cold. It's really great. I mean, like, she knows. I mean, they've been together for, you know, they met in 1967, I, I think. think. When they got married, yeah. Or 68. I mean, they've been together forever. Mm-hmm. And so she knows him, you know, up and down. It's really funny, actually. You painted this picture and when they was, it was at his 50th high school reunion. Yeah. And at this point, he'd won nine championships as an assistant, as a coach, as a player, just being in the NBA, nine championships. And he's dancing with his wife, Chris, at the 50th high school reunion. And he tells you, or you write, this is the moment when he should have and he said that, yeah. walked away. And he like said, he thought about it. Like, this is as good as it could ever be. I got the video of the reunion. And there's this moment when they're dancing when she re- leans, reaches down and sort of has her hands wrapped around his. And they're right up at the front of the stage. And, you know, he, he 
obs- every time he would go home, he would even now he just drives by everywhere. He'll go by the he'll park outside the house where he used to live. He'll go park on the hill in town where his dad used to park at night and drink beer and try to get the radio broadcast of the Kentucky games. He so, he went to the gymnasium, which is now named after him, and one time accidentally set off the alarm. Like, he's constantly sort of going back and remembering. Mm-hmm. And the reunion clearly is part of that. In 1984, when they choked away the NBA Finals to the Celtics, yep. people forget that that if they did it again, his career is over. Like, the thing you think about now is Pat Riley. He's just a guy who Magic Johnson dragged to one title and threw away two others. And so he's feeling this. They lose in, they lose in Los Angeles in the Forum. He does all this stuff. He has a friend from high school. He's really close to his friends from high school, which I always feel like you're good on me. If you like, you make it big and you're still close to those people. Yeah. That says something to me about the kind of person you are. And uh, you know, he shows up at wakes now when friends die in Schenectady. And so uh, he's out in the parking lot of the forum with his wife and his buddy, and his buddy needs a ride back to his hotel. Pat's like, I'll take you. So they go up there, and they sit outside the hotel to like 4 o'clock in the morning, and what Pat wants to talk about is, dude, we got to have a high school reunion, man. This is as early as 1984 because he just missed their, uh, let's see, he graduated in 62, so he just missed their 20th 20, reunion. Yeah. And so I think, you know, he's like, nobody goes, like, if you're a man on the make, it's hard to make it to your 20th reunion, but he's already then thinking about, one day I want to go back. And so the 50th reunion, he planned, like, like, he planned everything. A-list celebrity But he, he picked the music. Yep. They made a little video, like a cute video, and he goes up to the studio to watch it beforehand. <laughs> like, that like he's that involved in it. You said that him and LeBron are very, very similar, right? Yeah. Driven personalities. Where does their relationship stand now? You know, I don't know. I don't think they've spoken since that phone call, but I don't know that for sure. Uh, I'm not aware of it, but, you know, this, you, know you never know. Right. Uh, I think how hard was it for him to basically be rejected by the Because I thought it was a great diffi- you was, painted a great picture it was when super you said difficult. he had this presentation, he was gonna pitch him on the heat, he did and once he saw the meeting starting, he was like, I wouldn't even bring out Carter. You've, you've been out. in meetings where you're like, Oh, this is not going like I <laughs> yes, you yeah. know, I mean like we've yeah. all done like, Oh, this is not how I this is bad. Right. Uh how much did that hurt him? A lot. I mean, you don't get to be Pat Riley by not having an immense amount of pride, probably almost bordering on narcissism. You don't get to be that guy. Mm-hmm. You know, you know this. I mean, nobody who's really great at something's normal, <laughs> you know, and like, and so I think that has to be a tremendous blow because, you know, I feel like, I mean, this is putting words in his mouth a little bit, but like, I feel like, you know, he doesn't look in the mirror and see nine time NBA champion, freaking legend Pat Riley. He looks in the mirror and if, the Heat lost last night, he sees a loser. And if the Heat won last night, he sees someone who might lose tonight. Like, I think, that, you know, I mean, like that's how I think yeah. how people, you know, how people process the the sort of binary state of winning and losing. Right, Thompson, giving us a straight talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, half the cost. You say in the piece, you paint this, this picture of Malibu versus Miami. Yeah. Because he still has his home in Malibu and he still lives in Miami. Yeah. How tough is that for him? Because... He bought all this property in Malibu because that's where he wanted his dream life to be. Yet when he's there, he wants it, but he can't leave the other one in Miami. I mean, I think that's the conflict that many people face, and he certainly does. I mean, you know, I can I can't tell honestly after all of this and having talked to him endlessly about this, I can't tell if the promise of Malibu is there for him to claim or it's the thing that keeps him sane while he's chasing his other thing. Mm. Just knowing that it's there allows him to function and do his job. I mean, I, now you're like, we're like super complicated stuff, but I'm not really sure which it is. No, we want to hear you. you. said you have a story about him and Michael Jordan running into each other on vacation. We'll have that right. Tom's going to hang out with us uh, coming up next. We're still on the canal plus story time with someone who's written some fascinating articles. I want a Tiger Woods story. Yeah. On the one that he wrote, I want the Michael Jordan story. So sit tight, Wright Thompson, coming up with more next. ESPN Radio presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on Rosillo and Canal appear via the Shell Pennzoil performance line. Matt Barry, Dan Canal, Wright Thompson joining us in studio, giving us the straight talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, best phones, best networks, half the cost. Wright was uh, breaking down his Pat Riley long-form piece at ESPN.com. You can read it. I believe it's on newsstands now, right? Yes. We're, it's out and about. It's, you can get it online. Uh, you teased us with a story about 
Pat Riley and Michael Jordan running into each other on vacation. So uh, the uh, this is real. <laughs> the I think it's Hawaii. It might be like might be Bahamas or Grand Dix Bay, Little Dix Bay or something. But I think it's Hawaii. And so Riley's out there. He is at the time would have been the coach of the probably the Knicks. Mm-hmm. I'm doing math in my head, which is probably why you smell smoke. It's dangerous. <laughs> uh, but he's out there, and uh, and he's supposed to check out and decides he's going to stay another day. And then the hotel's like, uh, Mr. Riley, we need your suite. You know, it's already booked. And he goes, okay, it's fine. So they move him somewhere else, and that next day he's down at the pool, and he looks up at his, his former room at the balcony, and there's Michael Jordan on his balcony. And they sort of like, you know, and he's like, all right. So he goes in. uh he goes into the hotel bar that night and sees Jordan and goes over and they're talking and making small talk and, you know, still competitors. And, uh, and I'm, you know, I wonder if Jordan had just knocked him out there. Like it was, you know, was, you know, playing constantly. And so there's an open seat next to him at the bar and, uh, Pat's thinking, well, he's going to invite me to sit down and Jordan puts his foot up on the seat. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> And Pat's like, okay, I see how that is. <laughs> nice to see you. And then Pat slid a n- note under his door the next day before he left. It was like, great to see you, just so you know, or something, we will meet again. <laughs> that is unbelievable. Yeah. I'm pumped to have you in here because we've never met in person, yeah. and I love all your pieces. That's I mean, really it's nice. incredible. They're thoroughly entertaining and breeze right through them. But I'm kind of I'm, – I'm interested in stories from behind the scenes. Yeah. Like how – because we were just talking about Pat Riley. Like how does it work? And you talk to him like it's every day almost for two months. Yeah. Who has been the most intimidating person that you've had to profile? You know, once you're profiling them, and I don't know how maybe it feels the same. It felt the same for you playing if you had to play someone. I mean, I'm much more intimidated by the thought of failing at my job than I am by someone's celebrity. Mm-hmm. So it's not really that. I mean, at that point when I'm getting going to do it, I mean, I'm much more like I'm so focused on doing the job that like. So, I mean, it's not that I'm trying to think. People who are really, really intimidating. Who has been the most challenged to get to open up? Because probably like Jordan, Tiger. I mean, they're uh, very close. They're private. They don't want people. Pat was them. Pat was a struggle. Uh, I mean, Jordan definitely is a struggle. Uh, you know, there's a he's not. What do you do to get them to open up? Well, I mean, some of it's just black magic. Probably you don't want to think too much about it. <laughs> right. But it, it's you know, I think you do so much research on the front end that you're. The knowledge of them, if I'm coming to write a profile about you and we sit down for the first time and you're like, wait, what's this all? You know, Mm -hmm. I want to know not so not just so much about the details of your life, but have read so much about you and thought about it enough where I'm asking questions that are things that you actually think about as opposed to just sort of the crap you usually would get asked. So I want to ask one or two things where you're like, "Okay, now we're like. Like that, you know, that's a real question I would like to be asked. What is the goal of a Wright Thompson piece? I mean, you know, there's a guy I used to write for Sports Illustrated uh, named Gary Smith who said the following thing. I want to credit because it's smart and I don't want to steal it. But he's like, you know, every single story is, you know, especially about a person Mm -hmm. is like, what is the central complication of someone's life and how on a daily basis do they go about solving it? And like, I think that if you look at all of these pieces somewhere in them, that's what they're about. Tiger's a good example. Yeah. The Tiger much. piece, for those who haven't read it, get online and find it. You basically got into the details of Tiger's hunger to become a Navy SEAL. It's crazy. And you hung out with the Navy SEALs. Oh, yeah. I still talk to these dudes. And what was that like? What do they say? Well, they're, I mean, the best stories are the ones that aren't about Tiger. Like, these dudes have <laughs> yeah. great stories. <laughs> like, this one guy told me this story, and he was like, I'm not going to use names. But he was like, there's a guy who was in, you know, on a SEAL team whose name is, you know, George. Right. And uh, they're in Afghanistan or Iraq, and they're going door-to-door clearing houses, like like clearing a house. Right. And they're thinking, like, this isn't going to be that stressful. And then this dude kicks this door in, and standing there is, like, what was described to me as, like, the biggest man you've ever seen in your life, who just bear hugs the SEAL, and now, like, they're on the floor. And this all came about as a way of saying that, Martial arts are great, but really what you need in a fight is not martial arts, but something else. Because they were like, so the guy's on the ground, George, is flailing around and finds like a toaster. And then he just beats this dude basically to death and beats the dude nearly to death with a toaster. 
And like, do you sit with these guys and they have one story after another about, you know, the time George almost killed a guy with a toaster. And you're just like, these guys are in, that was my favorite part. I still talk to those guys because they're a riot. Would you ever consider writing a book about them? No. <laughs> no. No, because no, like you, you know, you piss off Tiger Woods, nothing really happens. Like you get a nasty email yeah, from a true. publicist. <laughs> Probably right. want to you go piss off the dudes at the black helicopters. Do you hear back from a Tiger Woods or a Jordan or a, after the piece is released? Do they give Some, you a review? Uh, yes, sometimes. Uh, and it's interesting. Like you won't uh, – I never heard – from Tiger or Tiger's people. I heard from people close to them. It was so weird. I was, I, it's my understanding that on the day that story ran, much like today when I'm running around, mm-hmm. at some point Tiger's on his airplane watching me talk about him, mm-hmm. which must be surreal. Right. Because by the way, the other side of that is he's like, this is a dude I've never met. Right. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, it's a, it's a weird thing that's going on. Because that story was from the account of people that were with him, not from Tiger. Exactly. He, did, he didn't talk. Right. Uh, and, you know, uh, Jordan's reaction through his people was, how do you find all that stuff out? And they were like, you told him. And he was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. uh, uh, But, you know, it's interesting. I think if you treat people fairly, look, you're a, like, you know, you guys are somebody. If somebody came to write a story about you right now, you're mm-hmm. pros. You don't expect a puff piece. But you do want, you don't want it to feel cheap. Sure. Like say the stuff I do wrong, but don't make it feel like you're just, yeah, just for the sport of it. Mm-hmm. So I think I don't know. It's interesting. Who's on the dream list? Uh, well, this is weird. There's a bullfighter named Jose Tomas who doesn't do interviews. I think the last one he did was 17 years ago, and he's like this cult figure in bullfighting. I went down to Mexico City to see him fight last year in like January, or February. I had a friend who was like, "Hey man, I'm going to do this. You want to do it?" And I'm like. Yes, I'll go drink mezcal. <laughs> right. And uh and so uh him, uh Greg Popovich, love pop. Uh <laughs> you think you could get more than two word answers out of him the way is the- m- maybe. <laughs> no. I mean like <laughs> right. I'd love uh, He's deep down, he has a personality. He has oh, to yeah, he, it's he does. He just, it's such a stick. That's what bothers me. Is he's bought into it so much, that's all he's going to show but you. It's but it's sort of funny. Oh, it is funny. I like to watch it because it's like, <laughs> it it's is. performance art. Like, the energy it must take him to stay in that character. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And he does it all of the time. And he's done it so successfully for so long. I want you, before Wright Thompson, you get us out of here, give me, because we're both big college football fans, Danny Canal, myself, we both love Oxford. Yes. For the beautiful people listening right now, you hail from that area. Maybe the wrong term with Hale State. But give me the best description of Oxford, Mississippi during football season as you can. Oh, my God. It looks like Republican Woodstock. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's That's really good. I mean, it's, it's really good. It's insane. I mean, it's like, you know, it's I, it's my I, it's baffling. Like everybody comes down there. And then after that, they're forever being like, come on, man, we got to get that invite again. <laughs> I mean, our house is full of people. All football season long. My wife hates it because I forget sometimes to tell her that we have house guests for, you know, the weekend. Right. And so do you do you write during football season? Or he's like, you know, I'm going to take the home games off. I rarely miss a home game and strategically work to not have to. Every now and then, like if something really comes up, I mean, I can't. There's certain, you know, I mean, there's a certain point where you're just like, I can't say no to that. Like <laughs> yeah. there's no, I've run out of. There's no logical reason other than I want to watch Ole Miss play. Is there a piece in the works? There are a lot of pieces in the works. Uh, they're always sort of in various stages of germination. I'm trying to think what's uh, – uh, I mean, there's nothing that's close. Okay. I mean, this one was – I did this every day f- for a very long time. How long does it take you to write something like this? Oh, I mean, it took me two and a half months to report it. It took me probably a week to read through my notes. It probably took me another week to write it. And we'll talk about it all day today, and then we're going to go get hammered drunk in West Hartford. <laughs> good. Oh, yes. There you go. <laughs> Look hey, out. We really appreciate the time. Anytime, fun. fellas. Thank you so much. Fun. Look out. Awesome. Great read. Check it out. The uh, piece on Pat Riley, ESPN, the magazine. I'm sure you can get it on dot .com as well. Right now. It's going to be a, it's a good, good read. Rasilo and I reminded you that if you're at work, you can stream all three hours of the show on ESPNradio.com. Right, Thompson? Good stuff. Coming up next, Warriors sweep the Blazers. Can anyone beat Golden State at next? And now, insurance-minded speeches from GEICO. Hardship. My grandmother would go through it every month to pay her insurance bill. 
First, she would handwrite a paper check in cursive. Then, using her own tongue, she would wet a stamp for an envelope. Today, however, we need not weary our hands and tongues. Today, we can pay our Geico bill with the Geico app. Away with hardship, in with bill pay on the Geico app. Thank you. Snoop Dogg. They've got this West Coast hip-hop thing going. Now, it's tonight ESPN proudly presents storytelling from a point of view never seen before. Yours. This is We the Fan, Section 250, a story about Chicago Bears season ticket holders brought together by Faith, Family, and Fandom. See the next episode of We the Fans tonight, 7 Eastern on ESPN or on the ESPN app. Matt Barry, Danny Cannell alongside Rosillo and Cannell. We had Wright Thompson in with us for the past couple of segments talking about his new uh, long-form piece on Pat Riley. Wright has now ascended to the top of my I want to have a drink and cigar with him and chat for three hours list here at ESPN. Oh, yeah. To the, he was to already, the top of the list. He was already at the top of the list of me. And remember when we said, as we were talking about him, what are we going to talk to him about? And I was like, the guy has traveled all over the world. When right. he went there with, uh, I want to profile the bullfighter in Mexico City who doesn't, and I just happened to go to that one. Like, he's a dude that's been places and seen things that I want to hear about. For me, the best writers immerse themselves in the culture. Mm-hmm. And the first thing he said is like, yeah, I'll go down there and drink mezcal. Right. Why not? And I'll go down there and live how they live and tell the story. So Wright Thompson, fascinating stuff. Can't uh, promote it enough. Read the Pat Riley piece. Very insightful to one of the great figures in NBA history. Also one of the developing great teams in NBA history. The Golden State Warriors, they set the wins record last year, come up short in the finals against the Cavs. They sweep the Blazers last night. If I gave you the Rockets or the field, who would you take? You mean the I'm Warriors? I'm sorry, the Warriors. The I'm like, field. man, yeah. I know you're kind of on I'm the sorry, Rockets yeah. there, but can we get that bet? Can we get that one going? Warriors of the field. Who oh, it's the Warriors all day long. All day long. And I wouldn't even hesitate. I would probably put pretty good money on that. I felt like they were going to win even if Kevin Durant didn't come back from his injury. Mm-hmm. They're still the same core group that is there in Draymond, Steph, and Clay Thompson. The group that was the record setting team from last year, who was a 3 1 lead away. And blowing that from winning a championship last year, those three, those that core, their big three, is still there intact. And I know there are some depth issues with the bench, but those guys are still there. And they even had things going so much so because there were some issues. Steph was a little bit cold. Yep. They got, you know, had their hiccup through the season. When they had things rolling when Kevin Durant was out, they still look like they would win without Kevin Durant. And then when you get Durant in the lineup, they're playing like they did last night when he returned. I've got the Warriors heavy heavy is this even a good despite thing? is this Steve a good Curry. thing for the nba cuz yeah. i cuz i've yes. seen artists like scoop jackson wrote you know a piece he did for our sports center and it said this is the best, best season, season we've seen there was an email that came across from our stats and information department said this is the best postseason we've ever seen cuz you're seeing all kind of records being set whether it's russell westbrook what he's doing whether it's lebron james challenging for you know other all sorts of records being broken. I disagree with that. I'm not a big numbers guy. Right. I'm not look, I, I think that it's impressive Russell Westbrook's average triple double. He's also on a team where he didn't have much help. Mm-hmm. So he is the option. I'm a big stories guy. And for me the story would again be Cleveland Golden State. Uh, so so my I don't think I think it's so good for it, the NBA. It is good for the yes. NBA. But what is good about the playoffs now, then, if we both think that it's going to be Cleveland versus Golden State? Are you particularly turned on by the Grizzlies-Spurs series? No. Are you particularly turned on by <laughs> Jazz Clippers? You could go through every one of them. That's The only reason I'm into the Bulls-Celtics now is because I had the guarantee that the Celtics are done. Which, by toast. the way, Rondo, though, no, no, there today. are There are some other reasons why you would watch the Washington-Atlanta series. I think it's compelling if you like to watch good basketball. But in the bigger scope of things, no matter what Washington shows me, yeah, I think that's a team I would like to see face up against Cleveland in the Eastern Conference Finals. I don't think it's a game changer. I still think Cleveland goes on to win. Toronto, they've shown signs when they're you know get at things going, they could. But it, for me, it's still going to be just write them in the finals, just put them there. Same thing in the Western Conference. Which team is it going to be that you look at the Warriors and say, man, that they might struggle with them? You can't even picture it. What does that say about the Celtics, who I've not given credit for the one seed now today and yesterday? <laughs> yes. I've given the Cavs the one seed for the last two days. I think it shows is- you how overvalued. Well, I think we're. I think when we do over, under, or properly rated, mm-hmm. I think the regular season 
is probably properly rated because I don't. I think people tune in and you hear the players talking about rest, whether they play or not. Would you look at what the Celtics did? It probably doesn't matter. And the Cleveland Cavaliers could have cared less if they were the one seed. They it, don't care if they were the three seed or no. four seed. All they needed was a chance at the table in the playoffs, and they knew they'd be fine. I Look, I think Boston's a good story in their own right. Mm-hmm. I don't think Boston-Golden State moves the needle. No, not at all. So, for No me, one aside from Cleveland versus the Warriors moves the needle. And that's what's bad for the NBA. Right. If it's, it's good not, for the NBA that they... Yeah, you want to see the LeBron v. Steph, Kevin Durant, the 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 tiebreaker. He's the villain now. Who does it? He's the new LeBron. He leaves Oklahoma City, goes to chase a championship. Fine, I get it. But while it's good for the NBA to have that three straight years, phenomenal story. It's bad for the NBA because now you're you're rendering some of these other playoff series. Like I don't know that there's anyone sitting out there in their office listening on the ESPN app at their home, watching on TV and ESPN News, or listening to the radio, that believes that the winner of the Jazz Clippers series. Has a shot to do anything. You know what the playoffs are good for this year? It's for developing stars, which the NBA is about. Because I think you're seeing Giannis. I think you're seeing a star develop in him. I think you're seeing Kawhi Leonard develop as a star uh, when he drops 40 the other night. I think you're seeing guys like John Wall, who's already been a star, but I think you're seeing his star elevate to another level. I think that's what the playoffs are good for the NBA. Because it's a star-driven league, and this is an opportunity for those stars to rise. Are we seeing now the damage of super teams? Yeah, I think so. I think some of the some of the stuff because you did hear it when it, when after you know, July Fourth last year when Kevin Durant goes to the Warriors. Um, I think some of those complaints, I think they were probably overstated. But in the bigger picture, yeah, I think it's a problem. I think if you have this much where it's a lock and it looks like it, I think that is an issue. Breeze pops, you have thirty seconds to sell me on the Celtics being able to make it to the finals. Celtics in six for the first round. <laughs> he's, he's sticking on Celtics in six. That's, That's it. a smart, smart choice. Just sticking with that. With Rondo back, though, I think he's definitely a little bit nervous. We don't even know if he's back 100% yet. He did practice day. Cass was off. There you go. He's back. They, we, we did this in the TV only segment, how apparently now Rondo's LeBron James, and if he's on a team, it just <laughs> makes them an all time favorite. All of your phone guests join us on the Shell Penzo performance line to Shell V Power Nitro Plus Premium Gasoline for the best total engine protection you can get coming up next we will have previously on Rosillo and canal do we have some uh we have some i think we have nominees some, yeah i think we have bill polian stories and i i want to revisit the millennials should you sign a millennial if you're an nfl you team? have no Just choice in blanket in general but you have no choice are they gonna, a stereotypical are they gonna pull you out of retirement you gotta find old school old souls is what you need to sign okay more <laughs> millennial hatred coming up next Rochello and Canal, ESPN Radio. Reminding you, if you miss any of the show, you can subscribe to our Best Of podcast, available in the Listen tab of the ESPN app. You know what I was doing simultaneously, which is why I kind of went silent? What? I was doing the song in my head, trying to filter out the lyrics that I think that I could do on live radio. <laughs> and in this Ice Cube ditty, today was a good day. There's not, there's not many that you can do. That's right. What was your favorite moment from the show today? Uh, my favorite moment? I liked... Hearing stories from Wright Thompson, I always feel educated when I talk to Bill Polian. I liked Reuben Foster. There was a little bit of something for everybody. Today. There was McShay. Yeah, McShay. How could I forget? Over about under. Our boy. Well, what was your game Over, that you play? Did you get to play because Rosillo's yeah. on vacation? Yep, he's been fighting that one for like six months. So he's away. So I was like, let's do it. Bill Polian is a wealth of draft knowledge, and it is draft week. So he is the focus of today's previously on Rosillo and Canal. Previously on Rosillo and Canell. I'm going to give you any number. Reggie Wayne, I think, was a great organizational pick. Mm-hmm. We traded down. Uh, the conventional wisdom has it had us not needing a receiver, and and we took Reggie Wayne, and he'll be uh, hopefully he'll be in the Hall of Fame. Edger and James was a great pick. Yep. Uh, nobody wanted him in the media, and we got roundly roasted. In fact. Uh, uh, so bad in Indianapolis that the switchboard blew up. We traded Marshall wow. Falk two days previously and then took Edger and James when everybody in the world wanted us to take Ricky Williams. So uh, that one was, was – we had fun and we're proud of that one, obviously. Um, gosh, there were so many guys down below. Melvin Bullitt, Gary Brackett as a collegiate free agent. Uh, 
you know, th- there's so many. I, I I can't think of one right now. Sure. That everybody focuses on the number ones, and right. those two number ones were really. You know what though? Just like a parent us. lighting up when they talk about their kids, you're lighting up when you're talking about your draft picks. Yeah, well, I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see him glowing. Right. It should be. Yeah. Well, happy times. The question posed to Polian was: Aside from Peyton, your favorite? Yeah, because he was pick. obviously eliminated from that one. Because I'm can't. sure that one is dear to his heart. But think about Peyton. what he said for a second, and that's why I found that story so fascinating. Was everyone wanted them to take Ricky Williams? Can you imagine if you got one former front office guy in a room like we did with Polian? He works for us, so we get the benefit of that, and ask him, "What did popular opinion want you to take? Who did you end up taking?" And how different the courses of a franchise and a player's career could be if they went one way or the other. If for whatever reason, Ryan Leaf stood out to them. Right. There's no chance Ryan Leaf would have stood out. I met Ryan Leaf in the draft process before Lee Steinberg, who was super agent at the time, is back to being an agent now. But at the time, he was the premier agent. He used to have a Super Bowl party every single year at the Super Bowl. And it was in Miami. And I went to the party, and this was... The Super Bowl of their draft year. So it's January, drafts coming up in, you know, April, um, you know, a little bit later. And I met Ryan Leaf. And I walked away from him thinking, how is that guy going to be the face of a franchise? I think it was pretty easy. What was when you it? sat down with both of them? Just kind of like he was like into like wanting to party, was kind of into things which seemed very immature. Mm-hmm. And it was just it was kind of not as impressive. Like you can tell with some guys that you talk to whether they're franchise worthy or not, and Ryan Leaf was not. There was an awkwardness too, just socially. Like it was there was a confidence, but it was kind of phony. You could see through it like he was trying to act confident. Sure. Because he felt like he had to. Um, and it was just weird. Like I, I when I hear people say Ryan Leaf or Peyton Manning, it was really a coin flip. I don't know how people would say that. I like to torture myself every once in a while. I'm a Cardinals fan, and I'll get on former drafts and see who we drafted and who we passed on <laughs> and just think what could have been. Uh-huh. And it's just torture. Which and you just you, you don't most? know. I think the year, I believe I'm getting the year right, but we decided that drafting Levi Brown, the offensive lineman for Penn State, mm-hmm. was a better idea than drafting Adrian Peterson. <laughs> that one and hurts. I was yelling at the TV. I'll give you one. Okay. As a Miami Dolphin fan, and the reason I'm aware of this one is because I was actually doing some radio work for the Miami Dolphins uh, down in South Florida. It was the draft when they had the number one pick. Do they take Jake Long or Matt Ryan as a quarterback? Oh. And everybody was like, hey, we desperately need a quarterback. They've been in quarterback purgatory forever, trying to find the next fill-in for Dan Marino. But Bill Parcells was at the helm. And it was Jake Long was the safe pick, the stud from Michigan. I forget Parcells. Stud there, and he's like, I'm going to go with the sure thing. You know who just retired? Like yesterday? Yeah. <laughs> Jake Long right. hung it up. And he was a good player for them for a while, but with the number one overall pick, it's interesting because usually you see boom or bust. I'd say Jake Long was kind of right in the middle. Like I don't know, He wasn't a bust, but he wasn't. Was, you know, he, this, was he a cornerstone offensive tackle? Was he a cornerstone offensive lineman? For a very limited window. For a very limited yeah, window. Yeah, because I have him as neutral. Right. And that's what, what I'm have... saying. Like, usually you see you know, like guys that just totally flame out or they're 10 year, 12 year Pro Bowl guys who last forever. What do as you a number have one overall pick, which Alex is what Smith it should as. be. Uh, what do you mean? As a. Because he was a number one overall pick. It's still to be determined. Like, he, I think you're happy. You're not, if you're a GM, you're not regretting taking him as a number one overall pick. Like, I don't think he's a blemish on your career. Right, Sarudi? It's also really easy to say that, like, you know, what if Matt Ryan did go to Miami and they were a pretty bad football team then? Would he be the same guy he is today? I don't think that's necessarily true. But was Matt Ryan a winner in college? I know it's a big criteria for you. <laughs> he was okay in college, yeah. He was all right. They actually did have some success. Jake Long, to me, is like Eric Fisher, who was taken number one by the Chiefs at a Central Michigan in 2013. Ooh. They're there. Right. And that's about it? Neutral. Yep. It's been a pleasure the last couple yeah, of man. days. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Ronnie Jones is coming up next.